for all the people out there shouting that Edward Snowden should have gone through the, the proper channels, Tom Drake and Bill Binney, Kirk Levy, and Ed Loomis did go through the proper channels, and all of them fell under criminal investigation for having done so. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Jessalyn Radak. She's a lawyer who has represented many whistleblowers, such as John Kiriakou, Thomas Drake, and Edward Snowden. Uh, she's a whistleblower herself as well, and she's now the National Security and Human Rights Director at Exposed Facts. Jessalyn, thanks for talking to us. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's work through some of your kind of greatest hits, and then we'll talk about larger issues related to surveillance and the security state. Um, you used to work at the Department of Justice uh, during and during the prosecution of John Walker Lynn, the American Taliban, from what a dozen years ago almost now. What happened in that case, and how did that change your entire framework of thinking about government accountability? I was the ethics attorney for the Justice Department, you know, despite giving advice not to interrogate uh, the so-called American Taliban without his lawyer and also not to torture him. It was clear the U.S. was doing both. And then um, I advised not to use that information in a criminal prosecution. I was informed unambiguously that he had counsel. And because of that, like with any American, I would say if he has counsel, you need to allow him his attorney for any kind of custodial interrogation. That was on a Friday and the Justice Department uh, office that I was dealing with called back on Monday and said, well, the FBI interrogated him anyway, what do we do now? I, I said, well, you can use that information for national security and intelligence gathering, but not for criminal prosecution because it was an improper interrogation right. without counsel. And then when the uh, criminal prosecution came up, all of your emails on this went missing from the official record. That's correct. There was a department-wide discovery order um, for all Justice Department correspondents dealing with John Walker Lynn's interrogation. The prosecutor had two of mine, but I had written more than a dozen that were reflected pretty badly on the FBI. Um, and I went to check the file. Back then we kept hard copies of things and they were not in the file. I resurrected them from my computer archives and wrote a memo to my boss and attached them and resigned. I said, I'm not gonna be a part of whatever is going on. What had brought you to the Department of Justice? That was my career ambition, was to be a lifelong public servant. But then when it got completely politicized, in my case, after 9-11, to the point that we were looking the other way, when there are pictures, trophy photos going around the world of an American being tortured by our people, um, it really caused a crisis of conscience for me. Um, let's talk about torture for a second, because one of the people you did represent was John Kiriakou, who uh, brought torture to the forefront. What did he do and what happened to him? Uh, John Kiriakou was the first um, CIA agent to actually publicly confirm that torture was an official United States program, that we were waterboarding people, and said unequivocally torture is wrong and we shouldn't be in the business of doing it. During the subsequent years after that interview, the CIA filed six crimes reports on Kiriakou trying to get the Justice Department to prosecute him, and it wasn't until the Obama administration opened a war on whistleblowers using the Espionage Act that he was in fact prosecuted on um, a couple of counts of espionage and two of violating the Intelligence Identity Protection Act. Like a number of Espionage Act defendants, he didn't actually plead guilty to committing espionage. What did he end up uh, getting as a uh, sentence? John um, ended up getting 30 months in jail um, and served two and a half years in jail and part of that under house arrest and now he's on probation. Um, but really, this is one of the smartest people I've ever met, speaks multiple languages, including ones we need right now for people in government service like Arabic. Um, and he will never work in the government again, though he remains staunchly patriotic. I mean, most of the people that I represent have spent 
their entire adult lives serving in the military or working for the government. Um, they are true believers, and I think they still do believe that this can be fixed or they wouldn't have blown the whistle and they wouldn't continue to speak out. Um, they feel like we ha we're not at the point of no return, that there still um, can be some sort of pullback on yeah. this. Well, that uh, describes in many ways Thomas Drake, one of your clients who, along with people like William Binney and Kirk Wiebe, uh, went through the official channel, or they went through what channels seemed to be official at the time. Uh, Drake was an NSA whistleblower who talked about wire warrantless wiretapping. What happened to him? You know, Thomas Drake went through every conceivable internal channel about a number of surveillance programs. He was talking um, mostly at one called Trailblazer, but he went to his boss. He went to the NSA general counsel. He went to the House and Senate intelligence committees and testified in two 9-11 inquiries. And not only did they fail to redress his concern, they turned around and prosecuted him and prosecuted him for espionage. So for all the people out there shouting that Edward Snowden should have gone through the, the proper channels, first of all, there are not that many channels for national security and intelligence whistleblowers. They are excluded from most avenues available to other whistleblowers. But second of all, Tom Drake and Bill Binney, Kirk Wiebe, and Ed Loomis did go through the proper channels, and all of them fell under criminal investigation for having done so. Let's talk about Snowden, your most famous client who recently joined Twitter and immediate, almost immediately got over a million followers. What is different about Snowden, the appeal that he seems to have to a wide range of people who otherwise look askance at whistleblowers? I think with Snowden, there are a number of differences. First of all, he has publicly said that he studied the cases of Tom Drake and Bill Binney and how they had gone through proper channels and how they got completely lambasted and skewered for doing that um, and made his decision differently to go directly to reporters, give the information to reporters and let them use their editorial judgment about what was in the public interest to know. Um, he also had what a lot of whistleblowers don't have, which is documentary evidence. Mm -hmm. um, that's very hard to obtain um, or actually remove from an agency. He's young, he appeals to many different communities. He appeals to a very youthful hacktivist community. He appeals to civil libertarians. He appeals to progressive Democrats. Um, he has broad um, cross-section appeal. He's incredibly articulate, and he doesn't want to be the center of attention. Now, that's a problem for every whistleblower. They want to shoot the messenger rather than listen to the message. What is the likely disposition of his case over the coming 10 years or so? Will he ever be able to come back to the United States in anything other than chains? I think he will eventually be able to come back to the United States. I don't think it will be within the next 10 years necessarily, though since 2013, we have seen a big shift in U.S. support of him. Uh, 40% of people, you know, 60% thought he was terrible, 40% thought he was had done a good thing, and now those numbers are reversed a lot. He has a lot more public support. But like the public support he enjoys in countries around the world, the political leadership um, is still not going to treat him well. And in fact, he just said in the BBC interview he did that the Department of Justice has not offered him any kind of plea deal, even though he has expressed a willingness to go to jail. Talk about the scrambled politics of this, because I think going into it, and you know, certainly in the early 2000s, you know, when you see somebody like John Ashcroft as Attorney General, who was telling people, "Don't you know, raise the phantom of lost liberties to you know ever say anything bad about the government," a lot of people were willing to say, "Okay, this is you know, right-wing conservatives versus left-wing de uh, peacenik Democrats." But that is not at all how it's played out. No, I mean, so many left-wing people, when Obama was elected, 
suddenly became very centrist on a lot of the more controversial programs that were occurring under Bush. Mm -hmm. And people are like, well, if a Republican did that, they would have been skewered, which is true. Yeah. I mean, Obama came in on day one and was like, we're ending torture. Right. We're closing Guantanamo. We're going to be the most open and transparent administration and has done the complete opposite on, on all three of those. Yeah. Um, but you know, again, okay, well, you got rid of torture, but you instituted a drone program that I think is even more frightening because at least if you're tortured, you, you can live. Right, to um, tell the story. Right, to, te to tell the story. Where Talk a little bit about, uh, yeah, and it's a horrible situation where we're saying, you know, torture is preferable to drone strikes, right, as a policy. Right. Uh, right. Uh, um, talk about exposed facts and what you're hoping to accomplish there, and um, where's the best place for people to find out more information about it? Sure. Um, Expose Facts is a nonprofit organization that was created to encourage whistleblowing and adversarial journalism. I am starting a new program there called the Whistleblower and Source Protection Program because for me, I've always said that the war on whistleblowers is really a backdoor war on journalists. And just as often, whistleblowers usually are the source. Journalists are, appear throughout every single whistleblower indictment. And I think there is a war on journalists and a broader war on information going on in our country. Are, uh, who's going to win that war? Are you hopeful that uh, kind of new media and new technologies, which on the one hand gives the government more ways to surveil you, but on the other way also gives these outlets for expression that you know, wouldn't have happened even 10 years ago? I like to be optimistic and agree with my client Edward Snowden that if Congress doesn't take care of this, um, that tech will. And you can see that. I mean, tech has gone ahead and created amazing encryption devices. And you can see the government's frustration with that because now in the UK and the US and Australia, they are trying to outlaw encryption. So, you know, I, and again, the judicial branch, I feel like, is finally turning on these issues and ruling that secret surveillance is unconstitutional and probably illegal. Um, so I do see change going on in that branch of government. I'm hoping that ultimately technology and internet freedom will prevail in this struggle. Yeah. Well, we'll leave it there. I hope you're right. We've been talking with Jessalyn Radak. She is at Expose Facts, and she's a, a lawyer to many whistleblowers and hopefully uh, more to come. Jessalyn, thanks for talking to us. Thank you, Nick. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.